This lecture is part of an online course on category theory. Um, so this is the introductory lecture where I'm just going to explain what a category is and give a few examples of them. Um, if you want a textbook, um, the one I'm going to suggest is the classical book by Saunders MacLean, Categories for the Working Mathematician. Saunders MacLean was one of the two founders of category theory and this was more or less the original book on it. Um, the title of the book is a little bit funny and Saunders MacLean actually kind of got teased about this occasionally. For example, if you look at the book on infinite loop spaces by Frank Adams and you look at the references, uh, let me just magnify this so you can see a bit better, you will notice that one of the references is by John McNabb, Categories for the Idle Mathematician. Um, this reference doesn't actually exist, as you can tell from the where it's published. And uh, that was Adams just teasing Saunders MacLean a bit. Um, category theory was uh, started in around 1945. The very first paper on it was this one by Island Bergen MacLean, um, General Theory of Natural Equivalences, um, sort of written, as I say, it was originally written in 1942, but published a few years later. There was a European civil war going on at the time. Um, so what we're going to do is start by giving a few examples of categories and then using that to motivate the definition. So we'll start off with the category of sets. So a category has things called objects and the objects are going to be sets and it has things called morphisms. And the morphisms of the category of sets are going to be functions. You usually name a category after its object, so the category of sets is the one whose objects are sets. Um, another category is the category of groups. And here we want the morphisms to be nice functions between groups. They should preserve the group structure. And these are called homomorphisms in group theory. And the word morphisms for category sort of comes from the word homomorphisms of group theory just by missing out the, the first syllable. Another example would be topological spaces. And the nice functions between topological spaces are the continuous maps. So the morphisms of the category of topological spaces will be the continuous maps. Um, and now we're going to uh, m define the general concept of a category just by abstracting the common properties of these three examples. So let's see what you get. Well, the data needed to define a category is as follows. First of all, we have a collection of objects. And you might think the objects will be a set. Well, there's actually a slight problem about that because um, the set of all sets isn't actually a set. So we'll be a bit vague for the moment and just say you have some objects. Um, we also have um, for objects A and B, we have a set of morphisms from A to B except sometimes this isn't a set, but never mind. Um, so usually in category theory, you draw pictures of everything by drawing objects as points and morphisms between objects as a, as a little arrow between these points. So if I've got objects A and B and a morphism F from A to B, I would draw it like this. So we've, we've got a set of morphisms as part of the structure of a category. Um, um, so thirdly, we can compose morphisms. So if we've got objects A, B and C, and if we've got a morphism from A to B and a morphism from B to C, then we should be able to have a composed morphism from A to C. And this is obvious for functions of sets or homomorphisms of groups and so on. So um, if we call the set of morphisms from A to B more a to B, that means we're given maps morphisms from A to B 
times morphisms from B to C. And for each morphism from A to B and from each morphism from B to C, we're given a morphism from A to C. So we've got a, oops. So we've got a function from this product to this set here. Uh, the final uh, piece of data we want for a category are identity morphisms. So for each object A, we have an identity morphism, sometimes denoted by one subscript A or something, which is a morphism from A to A. So if we draw A as a point, the identity morphism will, will go from A to itself. So that's the data for a category. Um, this has to satisfy a couple of axioms. First of all, composition has to be associative whenever it's defined. That means if you've got objects A, B, C, and D, and we've got morphisms F, G, and H going like that, then you can compose them in two ways. You can first of all compose H with G and then compose with F, or you can compose H with G and F. Sorry. Um, and these have to be the same. And this is completely obvious for functions or homomorphisms or continuous maps of topological space. So this is automatically satisfied. The second is that the identity map has to behave in the obvious way. In other words, if you've got the identity map from A to itself and you compose that with a morphism to B, then that's the same as just going directly from A to B. And similarly, if you've got the identity map from A to B, and you compose this with the identity map of B, then that's the same as going from A to B. So identity morphisms have to behave in the obvious way. So that's more or less the definition of a category, apart from this slight fuss about whether things are sets or not. Um, and you can immediately see there are lots and lots of other examples of categories. You can take fields or rings or manifolds or vector spaces over a field. And for each of these objects, there's a natural notion of morphism. And it's kind of obvious this satisfies the axioms of a category. Um, well, I'm now going to give um, a few examples of categories that are maybe not quite so obvious. So the first example of a category is a group. Here, I don't mean the category of groups. I mean, I'm taking a single group G and I'm going to form a category out of it. So the category is going to have one object. I mean, you could take this object to be the group G if you want to, but you don't have to. You could take it to be the empty set or something. I don't care. It can be anything you like. Um, and the morphisms are just the elements of G. And the composition of morphisms is just the product in the group G. Um, and you can immediately check the axioms of a category are satisfied. The identity and associative rule for G give you the identity axiom and the associative axiom for a category. Um, notice, by the way, we never actually use the inverse of the group G. So instead of making this a group, we could take it to be a monoid, which is like a group without inverses. Um, notice in this case, um, there's no sense in which the elements of the group G are thought of as functions from this object to itself. I mean, we could just take this object to be a single point for all I care. Um, so morphisms of a category don't have to be functions from something to something else. Um, another example is we can just take a poset P. So we recall a poset is just a partially ordered set. That means it's some set with a relation which satisfies A less than or equal to A and A less than or equal to B. If A is less than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to C, then A is less than or equal to C. Now we can form a category out of this as follows. The objects are going to be the elements of the post set P. And the morphisms well, how on earth do you find a morphism between two elements of a poset? Well, that's easy. There's, there's, a, there's one morphism from A to B if A is less than or equal to B, and there are no morphisms 
if A is not less than or equal to B. And we don't really care what the morphism is. Um, all we're saying is the set of morphisms from A to B has either zero or one elements, um, depending on whether A is less than or equal to B or not. And composition is obvious because if A is less than or equal to B, and B is less than or equal to C, then A is less than or equal to C. So if we've got a morphism from A to B and from B to C, then there's exactly one morphism from A to C, which must be their composition. So if we draw a picture of a post set like this, um, so here's a post set with three elements, and I'm drawing an arrow if something is less than or equal to something else. And this is just a picture of a category. So this is a category with three objects and five morphisms. Uh, you might think there are only two morphisms, but there are also three identity morphisms, which I haven't bothered drawing in because I'm just feeling lazy. Um, so um, um, you can generalize this a little bit. Um, I can just draw a few um, points and draw a few arrows between them and that will quite often give me a category. So here for example is a category with two objects and two morphisms. So the objects might be called say A and B and there are two morphisms from A to B and there are um, two non-identity morphisms and of course two identity morphisms that I haven't bothered drawing in. Um, a fourth example I can just take um, the objects to be the natural numbers 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on and the morphisms from M to N are just going to be M by N matrices and composition is just matrix multiplication And you can easily check that that gives you another the, the sort of category of, well, it's not calling it a category of matrices, a bit misleading because matrices aren't the objects, but never mind. Um, now I should say a little bit about the problem we had earlier, that the set of all sets does not exist. And this follows from the usual reason from naive set theory that um, you have this thing called Russell's paradox that if we took the set of all sets we could form the set of all sets not con containing themselves and by thinking about this you immediately reach a contradiction. And similarly the set of all groups or topological spaces does not exist either because they, these are at least as complicated as the set of all sets. So um, what do we mean when we say we have a category of sets or groups or topological spaces? What actually is the category? Well, there are several solutions to this annoying problem. Um, the first solution is to bound the size of objects. So uh, what we do is we pick some cardinal number, say kappa, and instead of looking at the category of all groups, we might look at the category of all groups that are hereditarily of size at most kappa. And that gives us a perfectly good set and we can form a category out of it. Um, the trouble is that's a bit tiresome because we need to keep track of the size of everything and um, mathematicians are kind of lazy and can't be bothered to do that. The second thing is to use classes. So, um, you may remember from a set theory course that a class is basically informally it's a collection of sets satisfying some first order formula and you can quite often manipulate classes as if they were sets. So with a little bit of coding you can form make the category of all groups into a class rather than a set and make sense of it that way. The third thing you can do is you can use Grotendieck universes. So roughly speaking, a growth and dick universe is a sort of set that behaves like a model of set theory. And what you can do is you can work inside some growth and dick universe, um, take, say, the category of all groups in this growth and dick universe. Uh, that category won't actually be in this growth and dick universe, it will be living in some larger growth and dick universe. So there's, there's some machinery for growth and dick universes for doing that. 
And this is actually quite similar to property one, where you're bounding the objects by some inaccessible cardinal number. There's a, there's a minor problem with this. You can't actually prove growth and that universes exist using the usual axiom of zermelo frankel set theory, so whatever. Um, uh, the fourth and easiest method of dealing with this problem is simply to ignore the problem. And this is more or less the solution we're going to adopt. As long as you're just doing very elementary basic sorts of category theory, this doesn't really matter. You can easily convert everything we say into into something that's actually strictly correct. If you do more advanced things in category theory and stop doing things like taking limits over proper classes, you really do need to be rather more careful um, uh, about whether something is a set or a class. Otherwise, you can actually run into outright contradictions. So there is a minor problem there, but it's fairly easy to fix and we're not going to bother fixing it. We're just going to ignore it. Um, now, the single fundamental theme of category theory is that we should ignore um, the internal structure of objects and just look at morphisms. So in, in most areas of mathematics, like group, if you're studying group theory and you want to study a group, you spend all your time looking inside the group and looking at its elements and its subgroups and so on. Category theory, the philosophy is you shouldn't waste time looking inside the group. In order to study a group, you should just look at the morphisms from this group to other groups or morphisms from other groups to this group. So uh, I'll start by giving an example of this. Suppose we have the notion of an injective map. Here we're going to work inside the category of sets for the moment. So we can give two different definitions of an injective map. So suppose we've got a map G from a set B to a set C. Um, then um, we can say it's injective if G uh, B1 equals G B2 implies B1 equals B2. That's the usual definition of injective. And this is not satisfactory in category theory because it's you're looking inside the object B. You know, you're looking at elements B1 and B2. And category theory, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to just define injective maps just by using morphisms. So how can we do that? Well, here's what you can do. Suppose you've got another object A and you've got two maps um, from your object A to B. Then, um, if, if the composition G F1 equals G G F2, this implies F1 equals F2. So now we've stated this in terms of morphisms. Um, so we're going to define um, a, a, a morphism of a category to be a, a monomorphism. if it has this property that for any object and any maps to be, um, if, if, if these compositions are the same, then, then the maps are the same. Um, notice the original definition of injective map for sets sort of is more or less a special case of this where you take A to be a single point and then a morphism from a single point to B is more or less the same as an object of B. Um, but in general, for a category theory, there's in, it, it, sorry, in general, in a category, there's no such thing as an, as an object with just one element. So, so this definition makes sense in any category and this one doesn't. And this is what you use to define a monomorphism. Um, so for sets, monomorphisms are the same as injective maps. Um, you can also dualize this. So um, if you've got any category, you can form another category just by reversing all the arrows. You, you can see that if you sort of reverse all the arrows in the category, you get a, another category called the dual category. And pretty much any definition in category theory has a dual definition where you just reverse all the arrows. So for instance, we can define the notion of epimorphism, which for sets will be the same as a surjective map. 
And for this, we just take the definition of a monomorphism and just kind of reverse the direction of everything. So if we've got a map G from um, C to B, then this is a, an epimorphism if whenever we've got um, two maps from B to A, um, then G, sorry, um, F1G equals F2G implies F1 equals F2. Um, I hope I've got all my arrows the right way around. It's really easy to get muddled up slightly. And if you compare this with the definition of a monomorphism, you see it's just like the definition of a monomorphism, except you've reversed all the arrows. And it's a very easy exercise to see that for sets, um, being surjective is the same as being an epimorphism. However, you've got to be a rather careful about this. Um, so let's look at the following example. Suppose I take the category of rings. Then it's easy to check that monomorphisms um, are the same as injective um, maps of rings. However, epimorphisms turn out to be not the same as surjective maps. Um, an explicit example of this is we just take the integers mapping to the rational numbers. Now this is certainly an, um, um, not a surjective map of rings, it's not a surjective map of sets, but this is an epimorphism. So you can easily check it does actually satisfy this definition. So um, in general categories, um, well you could say that epimorphisms are not surjective, but that's not really quite right because being surjective isn't actually defined for arbitrary categories. You see, in order to talk about a map being surjective, we've got to take the underlying set. In other words, we apply a forgetful functor from the category to sets, which we'll discuss next lecture. And all this is saying is that if you apply the forgetful functor from rings to sets, it doesn't preserve epimorphisms. The image of an epimorphism need not be an epimorphism of sets. Um, in fact, it can be very difficult to tell whether or not epimorphisms are surjective. For instance, there's a theorem due to Fawcett, which says that the four-color theorem uh, can be rewritten, can be restated in terms of category theory. So what you do is you take the category of all planar graphs with obvious morphisms between them, and then the four-color theorem is equivalent to saying that um, all epimorphisms of planar graphs are surjective. So there is true that epimorphisms are the same as surjective maps, but it's incredibly difficult to prove. Um, there's another thing you've got to be aware of. In the category of sets, if you've got an epimorphism that's also a monomorphism, this implies that it's an isomorphism. So I haven't quite defined isomorphism. So if you've got an, an isomorphism between two objects is a morphism between A and B such that there's an inverse morphism with FG equals the identity map and GF equals the identity map. And I'm, I'm not going to say whether these are the identities of A or B because I'll get them the wrong way around if I do. So for sets, Anything that's an epimorphism plus a monomorphism is an isomorphism, a trivial piece of set theory. However, this is false in general. In fact, we've got an explicit example just up here. This map here we've just said is an epimorphism. It's also obviously a monomorphism, but it's not an isomorphism. So this doesn't apply to arbitrary categories. In fact, there's an even easier counterexample. You can just take any partially ordered set with um, more than one element. For instance, I can take one with two elements and um, the corresponding category has just one non-identity morphism. And this non-identity morphism is an epimorphism and a monomorphism, but it's not an isomorphism. Okay, so the next lecture I'll be talking about functors between categories.